Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say at the beginning that it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and talk to, to you at the Digital Con uh, Cultures Conference. Very grateful to the organizers for a great event that they put together every year. So my name is Alexi Furman. I'm a photojournalist in the past, an immersive director, and an aspiring video games designer from Kyiv, Ukraine. And the project that I'm going to be talking about today is Aftermath VR Euromaidan, an immersive documentary about the Euromaidan revolution. In the past several months, I've come to realize that there were three mediums in my life that had the most impact on me as a personality and as a storyteller. Uh, the first one was video games. My father got me a PlayStation in 1997. And here you can see a photograph of me playing it with a friend in 2000. Um, I was a desired party host back then. Everybody uh, wanted to get into my house and play some PlayStation. And the second one was a digital camera that my mother got me. And uh, this began my path as a photographer. Camera was the first thing that I took to my hands that enabled instant creation. You could take it, go to the street, and start creating something, start reflecting on the world that you were seeing around you. And the, the final one, the most recent one, was a Google Cardboard that I got as a New York Times subscriber back in 2015 when I lived in the United States. Um, I put it together, and suddenly I was standing next to a kid um, talking to me in a war-shattered school in East Ukraine. And it was a very powerful, very emotional, invoking feeling. And actually, actually seeing that 360 video content was extremely close, I think, to actually experiencing something. That's why we refer to VR oftentimes as VR experiences. And, and then I think I realized in a world that is very saturated uh, with imagery, with footage and with photographs, I realized that maybe it was worth trying um, virtual reality, 360 video. So when I got back to Ukraine in 2016, I learned that a good friend of mine, Sergei Polizhaka, wanted to try immersive storytelling as well. And that's how our studio, um, New Cave Media, was born. And we started creating journalistic and documentary stories and packaging them as multimedia websites for Radio Free Liberty and an outlet called Ukrainian Truth, Ukrainska Pravda. And we also created several stories for The New York Times and Contrast VR. And we packaged them as multimedia websites. And I really think that 360 video as a medium works well, um, combined with other mediums. And in our case, they work together with texts and with photographs, um, giving a glimpse into the lives of individuals and communities that left um, the war zone because they couldn't live there anymore. Um, as, with, as with everything, I guess, anyone's doing as a creator, we wanted to go further. Um, we were coming from, we had a journalistic background, we are coming from a journalism world, um, so we didn't have, in our team, we didn't have developers or 3D artists, so we started discussing how we could create a piece that would be um, something that is now often referred to as walkable VR. VR where you can actually walk around and explore and interact with the environment around you. And we got to learn, and actually with a great help from our friends from a Polish uh, video gaming company called Farm51, we learned um, how to do photogrammetry. And it was a great reveal for us. You could take your camera, that, and we all knew how to work with a camera. You could take a camera, go somewhere, and suddenly transform the world around you into documentary three-dimensional models. And it was a great reveal. Um, and this desire to try photogrammetry coincided in, in time with um, thinking about stories um, that we could tell um, using walkable VR. And the story that immediately came to our mind, because um, there were several layers of living archives to the story, was the story of the morning of February the 20th, 2014, um, the culminating day and the most tragic day um, of the Euromaidan revolution when police forces shot 47 people in downtown uh, Kyiv, Ukraine, and three policemen died as well. So, speaking about why we decided to do this particular story as our first ever walkable VR documentary experience is, is because it's one of the culminating days of modern Ukrainian history, the only day that led to Ukrainian president fleeing the country, and the day that sparked a, a huge wave of Russian, pro uh, Russian propaganda um, telling deceitful stories using two-dimensional footage, using photographs and using video, and recontextualizing these materials, saying that 
they were shot in different places, they were created in a different time frame, so we really wanted to explain what happened on the street that morning and how 47, just 47 people died in a three hours' time. And last but not least for us, it was a story that was haunting us because I was present on the street, I covered uh, Euromaidan as a photojournalist, so I was present on the street when it happened and Sergei was covering the Euromaidan revolution as well. So everything that I, I've said came together in a project, um, a VR project, where a person would find themselves on Institutska Street in downtown Kiev two years after, as we were scanning it two years after, and learn what had happened through archival footage that he or she could hold in their hand and sort of contextualize with the surrounding world that would be scanned using photogrammetry. And also we wanted to populate the experience with human stories, so we recorded uh, nine through 60 video interviews of people who were present um, on the street that morning. And how it came together, we applied for a grant called Journalism 360 uh, from Google News, Google News Initiative, Knight Foundation and ONA, um, and we received it in 2017, but we couldn't really finish the project with the funding, so we held a Kickstarter campaign a year ago and received additional $10,000 to uh, finish the project. So a very short glimpse into how it looks like. Um, so you're, you're on your controller, you're holding an archival photograph that was uh, made in this specific place, place in that specific time frame. Um, everything that you see is photogrammetry and we had to adhere to CGI in instances where photogrammetry was not hard to use, it was not applicable for uh, some elements. And we also, thanks to the Museum of the Euromaidan Revolution, scanned many artifacts, things that were present um, at Euromaidan and we um, held them in the scene in this way. So, speaking about photogrammetry, and this is, this is an example of how it works with a shield um, um, that was there on February the 20th on the street, and you can actually even see this shield in the photographs. We took 136 photos of the shield, and then um, when you put it in a special software, um, it creates you a low poly, a low, uh, it creates you a high poly match, then you then optimize to a low poly then you can put it into a game engine. Well, photogrammetry is a tool that's been used by architects and video game creators for a long time, but it's, but it's very often used for creating props, very small objects um, that you put in the scene, and we use photogrammetry to sc uh, scan a whole street in downtown Kiev. I'm pretty sure, um, except obviously for Google Earth, which is a huge, Google Earth VR, which is a huge um, photogrammetric scan in a way, this is one of the biggest um, high-resolution, high-quality scans that I've, I've ever personally seen. Um, and this is how we worked with archival footage. So, I personally know uh, most of the photographers and videographers that were there that morning because it was only a 300-meter stretch of a street where everything happened. Um, and we adhered to a video synchronization made by the lawyers and activists, the lawyers of the um, families of the deceased, um, so what they did, they did a video synchronization um, looking like this that um, takes all the footage that was made um, on that street in that time frame. Um, and we're telling a story of these three hours and puts them together in this way. So just a 20 second peek into how it looks like. <laughs> So our directors and multimedia editors used that as a foundation um, to map the footage that we had, um, the photographs and the video uh, shot by Ukrainian and foreign photographers and videographers uh, to, actually, um, to actually understand when in time um, that was created. We didn't need all the footage uh, because it, we're not, we were not making an investigative piece per se. We just need enough footage to be able to tell um, a complete story. And from the very beginning we knew that we wanted to have a human aspect, uh, sort of a humane living archive, 
um, in our story. And it's been, it's been a, you know, a long discussion about how do we integrate human beings into virtual reality. A lot, uh, you know, a, a lot being discussed, being around Uncanny Valley, how when we do volumetric scans of people, they look artificially. So we decided to go with a good old 360 video that you um, switch to um, in a 3D scene. So yeah, again, a short glimpse into how this looks like. And we un completely understand that um, human memory you know, is transferring and some of the things that people are telling might not have happened exactly this way, but we've placed people in the places where they were that particular morning and they are telling about their experience in a very sort of factual way. This is where I was, this is where I came from, this is where I went. So, as you can see, um, one of the protesters is explaining his route um, that he took that morning from the bottom of the uh, Independence Square up the street where the police forces were. And this is how it looks in the experience. So a 360 video is a sphere that is placed in a three-dimensional world and there's a guiding line um, above you that shows you where to go. We used a game engine called Unity. Um, the project was done only by one developer who's been with us from the very beginning of the experience um, until the end. Um, and she worked closely together with uh, the rest of the team uh, to put it all in a game engine. And oftentimes my task as a project lead um, was to make every person in a team talk to another person. It's a hard project. Uh, management-wise, because it's a cross-disciplinary project that involves a lot of journalism, working with archive, but also a lot of uh, work of the 3D artists optimizing hundreds and hundreds of models to be put in a ga game engine, and uh, journalists who became uh, virtual reality directors. So my task as a project lead was to make all these people speak the same language. Um, and I, I've spent 11 minutes talking about what our project is, and, you know, it's worth saying what our project isn't. It isn't a time machine. Um, I often read in the press that New K Media have created um, a recreation of the events on, of, of uh, the Euromaidan revolution. It's not a recreation. You don't, you don't happen to be present there on the street on February the 20th. Um, you are coming to the street today. If we compare it to a real life experience that you could have, if you came to Kiev and reached out to me and asked me to give you a tour around Maidan, I would probably bring my photographs. And as I would be guiding you through the street, I would be giving you print photographs that I made so you could contextualize these photographs with a three-dimensional world around you, with a real world around you. And to be honest, personally, I have I have trouble, as a documentarian, I have trouble with these um, time machine experiences, although they are great. Um, for instance, we had an idea of putting ghosty, point cloudy um, th uh, meshes of people in our experience. But I have a trouble with that, as everything that you see in the experience is real. It's photogrammetry, it's archival footage, it's real people telling you their stories. If we put point cloudy figures, I really want them to have the poses and I really want that number of people on the street around you. So we've tried to stay as factual um, as we could in creating our experience. And you would be amazed, but the most, the, the question that I get the most is, can I throw a malt of cocktail in your experience? So uh, what our experience is not, it's not a game. So it's, it's, a docu it's, it's a documentary in virtual reality. It's a, you can call it an immersive encyclopedia. You can call it a museum in a virtual reality space. But it's definitely not a game. Although throwing a Molotov cocktail does sound fun, but it's, it's fun for a completely different experience. Um, the hardest part here um, is how do we distribute such content. Um, at the moment, it's... it's a little hard to place these experiences because there are film festivals and great events such as digital cultures where you could show these experiences. But I often get the question, where can I see this? And despite the fact that we've shown it in Kiev many times, it's still, because it's virtual reality, 
it's still at the moment tied to offline locations where you can where you can watch watch it. We've been to festivals, we've been to conferences, and we're continuing this route. But um, we'll see how it goes. Um, at the moment, VR gaming industry has a far better distribution than documentary VR. Um, I'm really grateful for for your attention, and I would be glad to discuss virtual reality, journalism, and working with, the, with these kind of experiences in your life. Thank you.